The Tolkien Road, Episode 171, Tolkien and the Meaning of Life. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, Episode 171, the episode that may or may not be plagued by extreme technical difficulties. (laughs) We will keep you posted on that one, of course. So, wait, we probably won't need to keep them posted. They, they'll probably be able to tell. Yeah. It it looks like everything's working. We're just not hearing ourselves super well, so I'm just I'm going to slowly fade out the music here and we're going to get talking. Let's do it. All right. We're we are doing it. Right on. We're making it happen. I think we need to just yeah, get on it. I'm going to turn up the monitor here so I can hear myself better. You're my lovely much better. Maybe the monitor was just too far down. All right. Well, hey everybody. Um so we are this is episode one seventy one and we I, I kinda th- I kinda decided to call an audible. I think I think on last week's episode I mentioned that we were going to discuss the quest for Erebor or the quest of Erebor. I can never remember which preposition it is. Uh, from Unfinished Tales, and I and I was prepped for that, and I'm actually want to do a two part episode on it, but this has been a really busy week, and this is kind of a busy time of year for us because we got school starting back up, and then I was doing uh, baseball tryouts today. I wasn't trying out. Uh, I I was watching I was watching 11 and 12 year old kids try out for baseball, and and just other stuff. It was the, the Feast of the Assumption this week, and my mom came to visit last night, and things just got crazy, <laughs> right? So, um, Excuses, excuses, excuses. I'm, you know, I'm sure everybody's just shaking their head, like, just, you, you failed us, John. Yeah, so, I'm sure they're very disappointed. Yeah. Um, so anyway, all that being said, I, and, and I, you know, I was just like, you know what, I kind of want to do a letter, because I... I, you, you all know if you've listened to this podcast from uh, from the beginning that that I really love Tolkien's letters and there's so much good stuff in there and they're very worthy of discussion. So we're done with the Hobbit and I I feel like I want to do a, you know some some more letters with some more frequency. And the good thing about the letters is they're a little bit easier just to there's not necessarily as much preparation required for us. Right. We can yeah. just kind of talk about what he's saying in the letters. So uh, not to say that they're always that straightforward, which we'll talk about. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, but I anyway. was going to say, did, did, I, did I read the wrong letter? <laughs> We're going to be talking about letter 310 today in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, which you should pick up a copy of, and I will have a link to in the show notes if you don't. <clears throat> um, before we dive in, I did want to mention Patreon, of course. Um, uh, Please head on over to Patreon and consider supporting this podcast for $1 per episode. And you can set your limit wherever you like it. But we appreciate any level of support you can provide over there. And if you haven't done so already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and say all kinds of wonderful things about us. So I want to actually transition our correspondence because uh, we received so much good correspondence, and I, you know, I always like, uh, I always struggle to get it to maybe get it into the episode, but I enjoy reading it and discussing it with uh, on the air. So what I'm what I'm thinking about doing is is having starting to have Q and A episodes, where uh-huh. these can be like you you guys can write in and ask us questions about Tolkien and you know, things that, you know, what do we think of this? What do we think of that? And we will deal with them on the air. So can they also just leave comments? Yeah. And, and I was kind of thinking it'd be a good time to like kind of run through all, all the other stuff that's maybe just kind, you know, like things they wanted to say to us or, yeah. um, uh, hate mail, you know, all that kind of stuff. Ooh, so yeah, we got to keep it balanced. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just have whole episodes where we just do correspondence. Right. And, but, you know, I'd love it to be if there's like a couple of really good questions thrown in there, like, you know, hey, 
I was wondering about this or what do you make of this and these sorts of these sorts of issues or like past episodes where we haven't you know, it's been a long time since that episode and you, we said something back there and you feel like, Oh, well, I can't really ask about that. Cause it was so long ago, you know, Hey, send us a question about it or say, Hey, I think you were wrong on this point or whatever. It's just a kind of a grab bag opportunity for you all. And when I feel like I've got enough good stuff to, you know, we'll maybe try to do it on, you know, I'd love to do that monthly. Maybe we can't do that initially, but if we can get to a point where we're just getting good, you know, good stuff, that mm-hmm. can be like a monthly, one of the episodes every month. It's just like a, fun. The Q and A slash mailbag yeah. uh, episode. So yeah, that sounds good. And um and yeah, I think that would be fun. And, and and here's the other thing. We've got I've added something new to the website called SpeakPipe, and this is a tool where you can actually go and record yourself, uh, like the audio of yourself. So if you have a question or something like that you want to ask, just head on over to TolkienRoad.com, and uh, you can actually w- we'll play you on the air if you leave if you like. Uh, you know, as long as there's nothing vulgar, we'll play you on the air and, um, and, you know, and respond to your question that way. And for now, since that's a new thing and I want people to use it, um, we will like those things will get priority. Right. So, um, if, if you you leave a comment or something like that over speak pipe, then, you know, we'll try to get you on the next episode as best we can. So that's cool beans. Yeah, so exciting stuff. Yeah, most definitely. So I thought it'd be fun to try to throw a couple of curveballs at you. We will get back to our episode on Erebor, and uh, and I actually want to make that a two parter. Um, and I'm actually, you know, I'll, we've been thinking about what are we going to do next, all this kind of stuff in terms of the big works. I'm actually kind of thinking that I want to do a detour and go back and and like just do a deep dive on the second age for a while. Because oh. the second age is obviously going to be the focus of yeah the show of the of the show mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and I want to be like beefed up and I want all of you guys to be beefed up so that you know we're ready to really enjoy the show and also like I just want I, my hope is that we're still far enough out to where um, you know maybe it, maybe it's possible we can influence this group of people to you know who are writing the show to say like. Hey, let's make sure we get it right. You know, maybe maybe we can hmm. find some insights, and you know, who knows? Um, so we'll do that instead of the biography or the. Yeah, I'm kind of taking I'm kind of taking it week to week right now. Um, I can tell. Yeah. So, but you know, we just I mean, gosh, I mean, hey, cut me some slack here, Greta. We what? just did how many episodes, and we went through the Silmarillion, the Lord of the Rings, and the Hobbit. Oh, you're you just know? gonna pat yourself on the back now, yeah. huh? So I don't just know. Think I'm, you can do whatever you want since you just finished all the major works all by yourself i'm losing my mind (laughs) (laughs) the truth is revealed oh did i did i whisper that out loud oh wait maybe that was just telekinetic i don't know maybe maybe they don't know what the truth is that i just said was revealed but i think they they do you're you're starting to talk like you're writing like you're in a tolkien letter right now (laughs) That I'm in a Tolkien letter? That I'm that, part. That you're that maybe you're reading a Tolkien letter. I, or I, your mind is yeah. thinking like a Tolkien letter right I now. I think I think it could be. Yeah. All right, let's talk about letter three ten. Good. Um let's so yeah, letter letter three ten. So this is to this was addressed to Camilla Unwin. And just a little background on Camilla Unwin. She is the uh uh, was is the daughter of Rainer Unwin and Greta? Do you remember who Rainer Unwin is? Uh, he's the the son of Stanley Unwin. True. You're looking at my notes. You're I am. Cheating. I'm totally cheating because I have no idea who he is. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Rainer Unwin was the little kid who. His, yeah, you're right. His father was Stanley Unwin, mm-hmm. who was the publisher that received the manuscript for The Hobbit, and then what okay. Stanley would do was he would hand the, the manuscripts for like these kids books off to his son Rainer, Rainer. and be okay. like read this and write a review for me and he apparently give him one shilling for every review um which i don't know how much that is um i don't think it's very much it sounds like the uh you know the old here's a dime jimmy go down to the, <laughs> go down to the candy store and buy yourself a licorice whip yep um so i, I don't know how much that is because i'm not british and uh, it, it, i think it's I think it's more than a penny, but not quite a dollar. Is it a sixpence? It might be a sixpence. Oh, maybe. It might be. Actually, um, I don't know. I'm sorry, all of our British listeners. I'm really sorry. I know. 
Wait, do they even use shillings anymore? They're I thought like, everybody was doing the what euros. What the bloody hell? They don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> don't even know what a shilling is worth. I'm done with these people. There you go. Sound an Australian again. I know. I was thinking, I was like, I sound kind of like Sharon I was right listening now. to a podcast the other day. It was, uh, oh, it was Conan, who was like my favorite. Yeah, Conan, Conan's Conan awesome. Conan O'Brien needs a friend. Um, and he had Dana Carvey on. You know who Dana Carvey yeah, I know is, who Dana right? Carvey Dana Carvey is, yeah. is the guy who played um, Wayne or Garth and Wayne's yeah, World. Yeah, yeah. And he's hilarious. He's both he's like so those funny. like those two human beings are hilarious. And you get them in a room together, and it's just like you're just like it's like my sides, my sides. You know? <laughs> right. Can't um, breathe. Can't breathe. I can't breathe. Yeah. And um, but Dana, they, Dana Carvey was talking because he's an impressionist. Dana Carvey's an impressionist. Right. 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 Yeah. And he was talking about how you like the different like nuances of doing like an Australian accent versus doing a British accent and a, mm. you know, and, and that got me thinking of you because, <laughs> because, yeah. because your struggles to do all the different, I, it is. and he's like with the Australian, you've got to kind of get, kind of kind of get in the back of the back of the throat and Sharon's shaking her head, shaking her fist at us right now. Mm. Um, I feel like maybe I need to listen to that podcast. Yeah, it was, maybe it, it was be helpful for me. It was really, really funny. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so Rainer, so Rainer would buy Rainer or, or get paid a shilling. Would get paid a shilling to do these reviews, review. and so he gave the review of The Hobbit, and and then the rest is history, right? Because okay. his dad was like, "Well, sounds like you liked it, so that's good enough." He, he, I'll actually read it since we just finished The Hobbit. Here's what Rainer said about The Hobbit: Bilbo Baggins was a hobbit who lived in his hobbit hole and never went for adventures. At last, Gandalf, the wizard, and his dwarves persuaded him to go. He had a very ex- uh, exiting. Spell it, yeah. The sick. It's exciting is what it's supposed to be. Exiting time, fighting goblins and wargs. At last, they get to the lonely mountain. Smaug, the dragon who guards it, is killed, and after a terrific battle with the goblins, he returned home. Rich. This book, with the help of maps, does not need any illustrations. It is good and should appeal to all children between the ages of five and nine. Five so and go. nine. Yeah. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have JR, We have that review to thank for J.R.R. Tolkien. Can we just say that's not really a review? That's a synopsis. That's that's a little kid being like, hey, Dad, pay me some money. Yeah. So I can go buy a licorice whip. Because he didn't say what he thought about it. He just says what happens. Right. But hey, it well, got does, us the Hobbit, so he, it's fine. He does say um, it is good and should appeal to all children between the ages of five and nine. I know. I just feel that so like it just leaves so much wanting well, it's a good thing you weren't Stanley Unwin because we thing. might not have The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings You're or right. any of this. I mean, how old was was Rhyme, Ra, Rainer when he wrote that? Uh, when he wrote that, he was, I think he was 10. He, yeah, it says he was 10. He wrote that uh, in 1936. Okay, I'm going to excuse him then. Because that's yeah. probably about what I would expect from our 10-year-old as far as a review goes. Yeah, and now can I go watch some TV? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, So... Uh, so yeah, that's the, that's who Rainer is. So Camilla is, um, or isn't Cam- it Camilla? Or Camilla? I don't know. I think it's Camilla. Camilla. It's his daughter. Cam- Camilla is his daughter. And she was probably, my, my guess is she was maybe a little older than, than, uh, Rainer was when he wrote that review at this time. Cause this is 1969 when, and, and Camilla had written to Tolkien and been like, you know, you, you maybe did a project like this when you were in high school, right? Where you're like, you have to find some wise old person and ask them about, you know, different things. And I definitely did that. I remember, yeah, I, did I remember doing those, mm-hmm. doing those projects. And, you know, you like ask, I don't remember ever asking like somebody like, what's the meaning of life? But I remember like kind of an oral history of like, what was it like to live through the Kennedy assassination or something like that, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but she asked, her assignment was apparently, what is the purpose of life? Which I think is really cool, and I think that's a question that people should just like have to write letters about anyway, on a regular basis. Yeah. And yeah. so this is Tolkien's letter about his answer to this question. So it is addressed to a, you know, probably my guess is she's probably like thirteen or fourteen. Okay. Um, okay. Because, like a ten year old, I can't really see them doing a project no, on what is the purpose yeah. of life. But like older. for a for a you know teenager, I can see them starting to deal with that, mm-hmm. right? Starting to think mm-hmm. like what's the purpose of life? Yeah. And. Um, I think Camilla got a little bit more than she bargained for. I was thinking that same thing. I was yeah. like, well, so I got, we were talking about this the other day. I got asked to write something for our, uh, church, like church bulletin. And, and I was like, I was like, okay, I've really got to work hard to not like overdo this because this is going like, this is like, it, it's a big, it's a big parish we go to. And so there's lots of people and 
I know just from experience that I have, you know, I can get, I can go way over people's heads sometimes. Nerd. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. It's true. And so I'm like consciously trying to make this like, like, like good, but like, but accessible, but accessible Yeah. to mm-hmm. your, to your average person in the pew. Yeah. <laughs> and of course the other, the other day, uh, the person who edits the bulletin for us is like, Hey, that's really good. But do you think you could dumb it down a little bit? <laughs> right? It's too smart. And, uh, and I'm like, I'm like, I can't, I tried already. <laughs> so, uh, I was thinking of that when I was reading Tolkien's letter here because I was like, man, this this girl, I mean, she, look, her dad, I'm sure she was a smart kid. Like her oh, dad was, yeah. a, you know, yeah. her dad was a publisher himself and was the son of a publisher. And, um, you know, so I don't think they were any any sorts of slouches or anything like that. Right. Um, but even so, it's like, wow, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Deep. I had to reread lots of it well, several times. And it's also not, it's also not like a lot of Tolkien's letters are like this. You have to be patient with them because there's so much good content in them, but they aren't, you have to kind of think about what he's actually right. saying. They're not super accessible. Right. Yeah. He doesn't like, um, I mean, these are letters. These are probably letters he'd like dashed off pretty quickly and didn't take a lot of time to edit. And, um, because he was probably, he was probably, Oh gosh, bother. I have to write this letter now. And I'd rather be writing, working on, the backstory of some random character in the Silmarillion. Right. right? right yeah. Um, but, or perfecting my ninth made up language that I've created. Um, oh yeah. So many other things, so many other things that you need yeah. to be doing. Yeah. So, um, so it's, but that's what we want to do. We want to kind of, we want to kind of deal with that and understand like, because I think, I think what he says here is really good and it helps you at least at the very least, if you like Tolkien's work, you, you get, to, I mean, anytime you get to hear somebody who you appreciate, answer what is the purpose of life you should be you should be wanting to hear that mm-hmm. oh right? i totally agree yeah absolutely. Um, i mean that certainly goes for me and um so anyway i'm excited to talk about that well, let's do it all right um okay so he starts off and he says dear miss unwin i am sorry my reply has been delayed i hope it will reach you in time what a very large question i like what he says here he says i do not think opinions no matter whose are of much use without some explanation of how they are arrived at but on this question, it is not easy to be brief. That's so true. Yeah. I mean, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Right. Absolutely. But explain it. Right. Well, and it's it's interesting he says that because probably the part of the reason she's writing to him is because, oh, this is this great author. And I'm, I'm sure like in the Unwin family, it was like, he, he was probably, I'm sure he was, I don't know if they were like super close, but they were, there was probably like a a connect, you know, a family connection. I mean, given how much the Unwin family had meant to his writing career, literary career, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's probably like, oh, write Uncle Uncle Ronald and ask him, right, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. And and so he's kind of like, well, if you want to know my opinion, I have to say that I'm just another person, and it's not really a matter of what my opinion is. It's how did I get there, right, right. right. Um, so according to Tolkien, it doesn't matter so much his opinion it matters how he arrives at his opinion so and i think that's a wise way to start start the answer to this question yeah i agree so next off you've got um in the next paragraph he says what does the question really mean purpose and life both need some definition so he wants to define the terms um now this is funny because i kind of feel like he right he was like yeah we should really define our terms and he kind of kind of runs off from there and doesn't doesn't uh proceed as methodically as maybe he was hoping to, to do so from the start um but but nevertheless, he has good stuff to say. Um, <clears throat> it is a purely human and uh, is it a purely human and moral question, or does it refer to the universe? Right. It might mean how ought I to try to and use the lifespan allowed to me, or what purpose slash design do living things serve by being alive? The first question, however, will find an answer if any only after the second has been considered. So I want to pause there because I think this will help us later on when he talks about the smaller question. I think the smaller question is the second one here, which is um, how, uh, what purpose and design do living things serve by being alive? Um, and then the bigger question is how ought I to try and use the lifespan allowed to me? Mm-hmm. So those are the big, those are the big questions. So he's saying like, like what, you know, I think basically what he's saying is like, what is the purpose for your, like for a human being, what is the purpose of life? Right? Like what, why are we here? And then he's saying, like, 
th- there's another aspect to this of of where did all of this come from, right? Like what is what is the greater purpose of life for everything? Right. Right. Yeah. For the, and how for do we ex- fit into that? For existence itself, he's asking the existential question there. Right. So, um, I think it it's important because he it's important to understand those two aspects because he doesn't he kind of talks about smaller and larger questions and and he doesn't necessarily come back but i think that's what he's referring to so the smaller one would be well we'll come back to that we're gonna we're gonna have to make sure we understand (laughs) um he says i think the questions about purpose are only really useful when they refer uh to the conscious purposes or objects of human beings or to the uses of things they design and make As for other things, their value resides in themselves. They are, they would exist, even if we did not. But since we do exist, one of their functions is to be contemplated by us. So he points to contemplation, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, He he thinks to himself that since these other things exist, uh, anything, like anything from a, and he says like from a plant to an animal to the things you see in the sky, whatever. Uh, Since these things exist, part of their function is to be contemplated by us. Part of their purpose is to be contemplated by our our minds. So put there for our benefit. Right, for our for our contemplation. For our contemplation. Yeah. Now that the term contemplation is a very loaded term especially for mm-hmm. a uh for a Catholic because um it has a contemplative prayer is this sort of prayer where you're um it's it's like the pinnacle of prayer, basically. Mm-hmm. You try to enter into the state of contemplative prayer where you're just, you're basically, your mind is completely uh, open to God, right? And and to yeah. the ex- mm-hmm. into all uh, the existential reality of God, right? Like you're just completely, completely open to Him, and so and that's not an easy place to arrive at. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily that that that's what he means here, but. Um, but he, he is talking about contemplation as being something attached to the purpose of life, which is good because I feel like that's kind of what our purpose is on this, on this show, on the right? Podcast, yeah. We, we want to contemplate, um, the works of Tolkien yeah. and, and derive and, and thereby derive the benefit that we can from contemplating his works. Yeah. Right. Totally. Um, what kind of benefit? Well, to live better lives. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, that's. That to me is part of the reason you contemplate um, literature or other artistic works is to bring you to an even deeper, uh, bring bring you to an even better state in life, right? Bring you to an ever be- even better way of living your life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's part of that reflection yeah. on what does this mean. So, yeah. um, so uh, yeah, so for Tolkien, contemplation is uh, is is a big part of all of this. Um, he he goes on in the next paragraph to um, to say like the human curiosity drives at the question of how uh, in what way did everything come to be you know and then why why did everything come to be um, and when he gets to that question of why he says why can only refer to it like you why can only refer to a mind right like if you ask the universe, why did you come to be like that, that presumes that there's a mind behind the universe, right? Or that the universe has a mind itself. Right. Yeah. Otherwise you're just asking it into the, in, into the darkness. Does right. that make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That does make sense. You know, um, because if you're just like, Oh universe, why are you here? Right. Um, you're, you're assuming, you know, you, you People do ask that rhetorically, but it's if they are asking it rhetorically, they're asking it like to what end, right? Really, mm-hmm. you know? You yeah. with me? I yeah, I am. I'm. I'm just trying to say what Tolkien is. Yeah, no, I and I I appreciate that. I'm just having a really hard time wrapping my brain around it and finding the words. <laughs> yeah. That I need to kind of express what I think I'm thinking. Yeah. Well. This is very steep stuff. Yeah, it is. Um, he says only a mind can have purposes in any way or degree akin to human purposes. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. You need a mind, right? Yeah. For there to be a purpose. Right. There has to be some kind of informed being or informed state in order for things to 
to come into existence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so he's, you know, he's, he's putting out there like if, if we, human curiosity always drives to this question of why we always get back to this question of why, why is it this way? Um, we're always pushing, wanting to push beyond that, you know, that, that curtain, right? Pull back that curtain and say, okay, why is it this way? And, and we hope to find behind that curtain a deeper, a deeper knowledge, right? A yeah. deeper mind, mm-hmm. right? So, but ultimately it presumes that there is an answer to that question of why, that somebody is capable of answering that question why. Um, so, why did life, the community of living things, appear in the physical universe? Introduces the question. Is there a God, a creator, designer, a mind to which our minds are akin, being derived from it, so that it is intelligible to us in part? With that, we come to religion and the moral ideas that proceed from it. Um, he says, so, and the reason he arrives there is, you know, he's basically saying, you know, obviously Tolkien believed in God, and so, um, and so he kind of lays out an argument for, here he's laying out an argument for why he believes in God. Um, and part of it is just like the, the question of intelligibility, trying to make sense of the cosmos, right? How could it all be here without a mind behind it? Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, how could we, how could anything even exist, including us without a mind behind it? And he says, with that, we come to religion and the moral ideas that proceed from it. That may be, that may feel like kind of a big leap. Um, but I, I, I think what he's saying here is like we we come to the question of like theology, like trying to understand who this God is, right? Who is this higher power? Right. Yeah. That created everything mm-hmm. behind everything. Yeah. Um I think that makes complete sense. And the morals thing is a little bit different. He says of those yeah. things I will only say that morals have two sides, derived from the fact that we are individuals, as in some degree are all living things, but do not cannot live in isolation and have a bond with all other things even ever closer up to that absolute bond with our own humankind. Um, so he basically says like we have a bond with other, with other things. And so there is a moral, there is a moral dimension to that. Um, now I think there's, for me, I think I'm also, I would have thrown in there something about free will. Right. Um, and because I don't know that like, I don't, I don't feel like animals have a moral dimension to them and is more, are not moral actors. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, nor are any other. They just operate more on instinct, like right? Innate instinct, yeah. Now I don't know. Maybe you know. There's no like an an, an animal can't be a criminal, right? Like a, right. an animal can't commit a crime, right? Um, and uh, and and if we're getting into religious uh, religious talk, it can't commit a sin either. It just does what it's what it's like does what it what it has to do by instinct right yeah it's survival um, right yeah so um but he but he does put forward here that that there is a moral dimension to to our lives so he says so moral should be to, to human lives at least so moral should be a guide to our human purposes the conduct of our lives the ways in which our individual talents can be developed without waste or misuse and without injuring our kindred or interfering with their development uh beyond this and higher lies self-sacrifice for love so there's two. So to break that down, he, he makes that two parts. Morals should be a guide to our human purposes first, because um, our individual talents need to be developed without waste or misuse, and second, because of that we don't want to injure others. Which is really interesting, because kind of the the modern way of looking at morals in general, and especially in Western culture, is like um, we don't want to. Inter- we we basically want don't want to injure our kindred or interfere with their development, right? We don't we want to um, live by the golden rule, right? Yeah. Um, don't hurt others, basically. Do unto others. But yeah. but it's and that's why it's interesting. He threw in the first part first, which is we have a responsibility to use our own talents in in a moral way, right? Being good stewards. Yeah, of ourselves. Yeah. Right. And the gifts we've been given. Which is not, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's something that you hear as much, but... Um, like with regards to morals? Right. You mean? Like, yeah. and, it, and if we do, it's like, well, you have a, you know, the most, maybe the most, um, uh, and, and I don't want to get way into a partic- uh, a probably controversial issue, but, um, but there is a lot, 
I think growing acceptance for something like um, euthanasia or assisted suicide, right? Mm -hmm. In the Mm -hmm. sense of like, well, you know, if you don't want to live your life anymore, then you don't have to live your life anymore. And, um, and I think the reason people look at that is because they've forgotten the first part, right? The ways in which our individual talents can be developed without waste or misuse. Right. Um, Mm. and, and not to parse the words there, but just to be like, there is a responsibility to use to that. We don't, we're, we don't just own ourselves, right? If there's some greater power that put us here, then we have a responsibility to that greater power in terms of what he's given us. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, what, what they have given us. So, um, anyway, interesting ask, interesting thoughts about morality yeah, there. Definitely. And then he says, but these are only answers to the smaller question. And again, I get confused about what the smaller question is here. Um, I think it's, I think it's this, the smaller question I think is the, um, what purpose or design or, uh, it, it, the smaller question is how ought I to try and use the lifespan allowed to me? Um, which is where he gets into that moral question. Um, but I like, I think what he says next is really interesting. He asks, if we ask why God included us in his design, we can really say no more than because he did. That there's this, like, mm-hmm. you know, we want to know, like, that's that's funny because he says, like, the why question is, at, you know, we ask why. Why is all this here? Why am I here? Mm-hmm. And the only answer we might get is because is because we are and because someone put us here. Yeah. Right? Because because God put us here Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, that, you know, that's, uh, I, I find that, I find that kind of be a pretty interesting, a pretty interesting wall to run up against. Um, then he takes to task the idea that, you know, if you don't believe in a personal God, right. Um, then it's, would seem like the purpose of life is essentially unaskable and unanswerable because there's no answer to the how Mm -hmm. and to the why. Right. Because there's no higher being that you believe is the answer to that. Right. Yeah. And and so, you know, the person who doesn't believe in God might push back and say, well, he just said that all you're going to get from God is because is because he felt like it is an, is kind of an arbitrariness. And <clears throat> to a certain extent, that's true. But you have a mind behind it. Right. That you have a mm-hmm. you have a mind behind it. And there might be a there might be more to say on that subject. Right. There might be more than just like because I felt like it. Right. right. Which is interesting that he kind of went from this, this, I, you know, this, uh, we can really say no more than because he did to putting the adjective personal in front of God. Mm-hmm. That seems like an interesting leap to me because I feel like he's gone from just like a very kind of ambiguous idea of a higher power, whoever mm-hmm. that might be that you name to personal God. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Because a personal God, that makes him much more relatable and much more approachable where instead of just this nebulous kind of being that's mm-hmm. out there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, it, it is. Um, that's a great thing to pick up on because I think a lot hinges on how you define that word personal. Oh, it does. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, I think it can be... I think it may be a more philosophical term, like uh, than than we than either of us realize, because neither of us are trained philosophers. But um, because when you when when your average person hears the word personal, they're just going to think of like kind of a human person, right? That, and, yeah. And they're going to think on our level of existence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not necessarily everything that is meant when you talk about a personal God. Now here's here's the problem is like, I'm, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm, I believe in God. Right. Um, I, and, and I believe in God, not just in terms of like revelation, but also on a natural level that like, I don't think that anything would be here if there weren't a mind behind Mm -hmm. everything, Mm -hmm. right. Behind it all. Yeah. Um, and I just don't see how you can, I, I just don't see how that's possible. Right. Um, and, um, what does that mean to then call that God personal? Is it just that there's a mind, right? That there, that there's a, like that, it, that this God has a mind. Um, and that's where it kind of, you know, yeah. it can trip me up a little bit. It can with trip what me up saying. too. And I was just going to say, when I think of the word personal, 
kind of want to, what I think of is someone that, that means something mm-hmm. to me, someone that I have a relationship with, but I can see where it could also be met. It can also be interpreted in a different way too. Right. Meaning it's someone who's has a hand in, you know, in creating persons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's probably an aspect of that too, to, to relatable. Yeah, right. Relatable. And on some, yeah. le- on some level, um, that other persons like ourselves could relate to not necessarily a human person, but a, you know, a great, you know, a, 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 relata- that we're a relatable to. intelligence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's a whole loaded question of what does that term personal yeah. actually yeah, mean there? Is. Uh, but Tolkien jumped to it and I'm willing to kind of trust him that he's using it well there, mm-hmm. um, given yeah. his probably much better education than I ever had. Um, he says, what is the purpose of life is unaskable and unanswerable if you if you don't believe in this personal God. Uh, to whom or what would you address the question? Uh, and, now, and let me say this too. I think it's very important to emphasize that Tolkien is not necessarily, in, a, in any of this at this point, insisting on the, uh, the Catholic view of God, right? Um, like he's not, he's not shoving that down her throat. He's trying to logically kind of get her to, a, like, to understand why he's, why, you know, kind of some first steps, yeah. right, of, yeah. of how he approaches the meaning of life. Right. And why he believes in God, right? Um, and this is a distinction as Catholic, you know, like, we're often told, like, kind of here in Catholic circles is, like, you know, on a natural level, you believe in the existence, you know, God can be kind of understood to exist, although we may not know a lot about him, right? Um Whereas on a, and then that, and that's where revelation and theology come in. And he doesn't really talk too much about any of that in this letter. Um, so um, to whom or what would, uh, would you address the question? But since in an odd corner of the universe, things have developed with minds that ask questions and try to answer them. He's talking about us. We're that odd corner of the universe. You might address one of these peculiar things. Um, as one of them, I should venture to say, I am as I am. Um, there is nothing you can do about it. You may go on trying to find out what I am, but you will never succeed. And why you want to know, I do not know. Perhaps the desire to know for the mere sake of knowledge is related to the prayers that some of you address to what you call God. At their highest, these seem simply to praise him for being, as he is and for making what he has made, uh, as he has made it. Um, so um, he kind of he kind of looks and says, looks at the phenomenon of prayer there. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And and re- and read something into that um and says, you know, at some level these prayers seem to just be the point of them seem to be praising God, right? Praising the one who's behind everything. Um well also the the, the desire to know. Right. is what is what is um is is what is what drives us to prayer really is what he's saying too. Right. Isn't he? Yeah, he is. You're right. Um, perhaps the desire to know for the mere sake of knowledge is related to the prayers that some of you address to what you call God. Um, and I mean, I, this is something, you know, I feel like when I'm, you know, thinking about the, you know, the state of the world, um, you know, I, I mean, it's, I mean, I probably daily, I just feel like I ask like kind of in a prayerful way, ask God like why? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, why is a certain thing this way? Why does this have to be this way? Um, you know, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a, I think that's where you get. And as you start to enter, as you enter into a deep relationship with, with God, as you develop this, you start wanting to ask the question of why. And it's really interesting to look at a lot of religious texts and um, like the Psalms, you know, there's a lot of asking why, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and lots of times a very elevated language, but but that's essentially what it's what's being asked, right? And that brings into into mind the just that whole notion of a personal God, mm-hmm. someone that you you can talk to. There you go, personal God, personal God, right? Um, so the and and so those who believe in a personal God, Creator, do not think the universe is in itself worshipful, though devoted study of it may be one of the ways of honoring Him. And while as living creatures we are in part within it and part of it, our ideas of God and ways of expressing them will be largely derived from contemplating the world about us. Though there is also revelation both addressed to all men and to particular persons. Um, 
All right, so he says our ideas of God and ways of expressing them will be largely derived from contemplating the world around us. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's where he kind of ties everything back to that to contemplation, which came earlier in the letter, and um, and and relating all of this to, you know, to knowing God maybe being the the purpose of life. So he lands on so it may be said that the chief purpose of life for any one of us is to increase according to our capacity our knowledge of God by all the means we have and to be moved <clears throat> by it to praise and thanks. And that's where he brings in the Gloria. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and for those who don't know what he quotes here, to do as we say in the Gloria and Excelsis, Laudamus te, benedicamus te, adoramus te, glorificamus te. So this is um, this is from the liturgy, uh, the Roman Catholic liturgy for the Mass. Um, what he what he says in Latin here, which is translated: We praise you, we call you holy, we worship you, we proclaim your glory, we thank you for the greatness of your splendor. Um, and he relates that to the song of the three children in Daniel, uh, in, in the book of Daniel. Which would, isn't that technically apocrypha? It says Daniel 2. I, I, we, we, we talked about I was, that. On we a, did talk about related, this earlier. I know. And I'm just like, yesterday. it's so funny that it's come I, up again. I, I don't think it is. I don't, I, th- I don't think what he's saying here is, I don't, I don't know where, where that question is coming from. Uh, we can talk about that probably offline, but. Oh no! I was just wondering because I was not familiar yeah. with Daniel two. Well, I, I okay. I, I'm Side I'm not note. sure what to tell you. It's it's part of yeah. the book of Daniel. That's a that's a whole other question. Okay. Like we're bringing a, a question we were talking we were talking about. Sorry for the sidetrack. This is going to become a Catholicism podcast. <laughs> um. Uh. So, but anyway, he refers to he refers to some scripture there and saying, um. In moments of exaltation, we may call on all created things to join in our chorus, speaking on their behalf, as it's done in Psalm 148. So basically where he lands is that all of creation, including human beings, but the stars, the sun, the moon, um, all of that exists to um, to praise God, right? Yeah. To praise this personal God that's behind behind it all. Um, uh, so, Which means that would be our purpose as well. Right. And therefore, that's the meaning of life or the purpose of life. Exactly. To glorify God. Um, and I'm trying to look up because the the song of the three children is, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of it for you all. The song of the three children is, in, is used very frequently in the Liturgy of the Hours of the Roman Catholic Church. And let me see if I can find it. Is it tomorrow? Will it be tomorrow? Morning prayer on two of the four Sundays. Uh, not this one. Let's see here. So this would be... Um, oh, you know where it would have been? Last it would, week. It would have been on... Um, wait a minute. You're doing that Saturday. Oh, yeah, I am. It would have been uh, on the Feast of the Assumption, which was... Oh, because that was a solemnity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I this think This is exciting. I know for everybody. I know. to be type. <laughs> All right, here we go. Don't worry. It'll be worth it, people. Uh, it's from the book of Daniel... I'll just read a little bit of it, and it's like, uh, Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Angels of the Lord, bless the Lord. You heavens, bless the Lord. All you waters above the heavens, bless the Lord. All you hosts of the Lord, bless the Lord. Sun and moon, bless the Lord. Stars of heaven, bless the Lord. Every shower and dew, bless the Lord. All you winds, bless the Lord. Fire and heat, bless the Lord. Cold and chill, bless the Lord. Dew and rain, bless the Lord. Frost and chill, bless the Lord. Ice and snow, bless the Lord. Nights and days, bless the Lord. Light and darkness, bless the Lord. Lightnings and clouds, bless the Lord. And that's just part of it. But that's this whole litany of, of praise right yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Of like, uh, you human writing this, but telling all of creation to bless to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Right. Yeah. So that's what Tolkien arrives at. Right. That that's what he arrives at is the purpose of life. Um, it's really interesting how he got there. Yeah, and you know, I I mean, I would have loved to hear him write more on this and maybe edit it a little bit. But you know, again, he was writing to this. You know, and she probably just wrote down. Professor Tolkien said, "Praising God is the right. is the reason for is the purpose of life." You know, she probably didn't deal too much, but he felt the need to you know to lay all this out and maybe maybe a slightly haphazard fashion. But I think he uh, ultimately you can follow his logic and um, and it is a very 
uh, very Christian, a very Catholic logic. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, some things I might have said a little differently myself, but um, but what's uh, one point I want to end on here is we talked last week about the Lord of the Rings TV show, and I saw so I saw this somebody tweeted earlier this week, uh, some random person um, tweeted that Tolkien wasn't really like a devout Catholic. He was just like a, um, uh, uh, he was just pretending because it was culture, you know, he, he culturally had to be a Christian because, you know, it was the only way to have a good career and everything like that. And I mean, which is, it's just an asinine thing to say. It's like, there's Mount, there's so much evidence and like, there's just no reason, like, it's just stupid thing to doubt it. It's like the same people who like, want to argue that Jesus never existed, right? It's like, yeah. come on, right? Like, you know, I, I see what you're trying to do, but that's stupid. Um, and <clears throat> so, but but part of me also maybe understood where this person was coming from, and because I think they have some kind of, they may be like a pagan themselves or something like that, and so they wanted to argue that Tolkien really wanted to be a pagan and all this kind of stuff because of, you know, like, so be, in a pagan meaning, like somebody who like, believes there's like a kind of a polytheist like believes in like multiple gods and Mm -hmm. everything like that i've heard people put forth this argument even catholics some like really conservative catholics will actually condemn lord of the rings and tolkien's works because they have a they claim they have a polytheistic view of the world because of like the valar and everything like that Mm -hmm. but they they don't understand because who's the one that the everybody actually worships eru right iluvatar right right? who's who's god um so that that got that got me a little riled up reading that this person saying that, but it also got me thinking a lot about, um, you know, how is religion going to play into the second age? Because actually, the religion is a very important aspect of the second age of mm-hmm. middle. So I'm really hoping they take some time to get a TV show right, the second age religion, because on Numenor, the Dunedain, right? They had Mental Tarma, which was their holy mountain, which mm-hmm. was where they would go, and who would they praise? They would praise God right that was the center of they had it they had a religion in numenor and it was to worship the true god i didn't know that yeah Hmm. so um and that's part of the reason i think i want to go back and do a deep dive on the second age gotcha okay um so we actually see that reflected you know uh not only in tolkien's own personal thought but also really when you get down to it in his works so yeah absolutely um uh so it's a complex question but uh but I, i you know I wanted to hear what old Tolkien had to say, yeah. our, what our boy had to say on, uh, the, purpose of on life. the purpose of life, which is, it's really so interesting. Soon-y. It's really interesting. Cause I, this is, you know, Catholic or not, <clears throat> like if you're a Christian, this is totally something you can get on board with. Yeah. You know, I mean, even the, the Baltimore catechism will say, mm-hmm. you know, why, I mean, I can't remember the exact words, but it's basically why, oh, why, uh, why did God make you right? Yeah. He, he made you to, to enjoy you know to glorify him and to enjoy him forever Mm -hmm. right so i mean this is something that's i feel like anybody who calls themselves a christian could agree with oh yeah yeah this really is our purpose in life right yeah um yeah would have loved would have loved more to the letter um but uh but it was you know well it's funny because tolkien ends it he's saying this is much too long and also much too short right yeah (laughs) gotta gotta remember that last line (laughs) on such a question that is a very tolkien thing to say Mm mm-hmm um, do not go to the elves for the, they will say both no and yes. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's what we got. That's yeah. what we have for you all this week. Little, uh, you know, just, just something a little light for you. Just talking yeah, about know, right? the purpose of life. Yeah. So just, the meaning of life. You know, yeah. Just something chill on the weekend. Just, mm-hmm. you know, um, we will do our best to get caught up on correspondence next on the next episode. Yeah. And so sorry for those who we have not, uh, uh read yet on the podcast. And, uh, but we will definitely get you caught up here at some point. Do not forget, um, go over to the website, TolkienRoad.com, and hey, you know, start. Uh, we'd love to hear from. We'd love to hear your voices on Speakpipe. Yeah, that, so, that's gonna be fun. I think it will. I, I just hope people use it. So, um, and and then remember, you know, ask us the burning questions in your mind about Tolkiendom, and we look forward to doing those Q and A episodes eventually. Yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. So. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we will talk at you next time. Yeah, we will. All right. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.
We almost forgot to thank our patrons. It's all Greta's fault. I blame it on her. Mm-hmm. Actually, can we please set the record straight? It was I'm the reason that we're actually thanking them right now. This is true. Yep. Um, Al Taylor. Andrew Herbert. Andrew Thomas. Asia, Asia Viner. Bethany Engler. Brendan Corkery. Brian Orr. Caitlin Howell. Kat Lane. Chris Loftus. Chuck Farnung. Connor Fogarty. Daniel Delaney. David... I can't see. David yeah. Bates. Oh, yeah. I was like, okay. that's not a hard one to say. <laughs> David Bigwood. <laughs> Amelia Perea. Hunter Johns. Ish of the Hammer. James Applegate. James Lindbergh. Joe Towns. John Rice. Margaret Lyon. Matt Scarrance. Robert Franks. Sarah Murphy. Shannon Stockbridge. Teresa Colangelo. Ty Miller. Tyler Shelley. Dr. William Hutton. And Zeke Farmer. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, guys. And now we will really talk at you Yeah, next time. we really will. So be here. Bye, guys. Bye.